I'm going to show you how to get from here to here. And then I'm going to show you how to win this endgame that we have on the board right now. Let's go for it. Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about Rui Lopez exchange variation. And I'm going to divide the video into main sections. The first section is all the things you need to know about the opening, mid game and end game of this line that we are learning today. And in the second section I'm going to show you practical examples real life games by masters where they are going to use this strategy that we are learning here in this video. So you can actually play that strategy in your own games. You can learn from these real games and then use it in your own games. Let's get started. So we're talking about Rui Lopez exchange variation. So it could be like this, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and then we play bishop b5. At this point, black plays a6 is the main line, not the only option, but main line and most popular reply. And then when this happens, we can play bishop takes a6. And this is the exchange variation in Rui Lopez. So after bishop c6, they cannot capture with b because they are losing the pawn. They need to capture with d. So if we capture the pawn on e5, they can play queen d4 and they get the pawn back. And this is where our work starts because here we're going to talk about uh, the opening that we have and the options and the context of this situation. First of all, we need to understand that we're trading the bishop for the knight. Usually that's not so great, but this time we are playing this because we are getting some compensation. The compensation can be different depending on the line that we play at this point. For example, if we castle here, our compensation will be development advantage. We will be playing a mid game where we are ahead in development. And that's why uh, we gave the bishop to continue our development very quickly. And we didn't have to move the bishop back, wasting a turn. So that's the compensation if we castle. We played the mid game and we are ahead in development. But that line is for another video. Today we're going to cover the line where we play for the end game. And we're going to analyze this line of d4 where we are going to trade queens. In this case, the compensation is not precisely development advantage. The compensation is going to be better pawn structure. Because something is going to happen in the pawn structure that is going to mean a, a big problem for black in that position. So there we have the two bishops in an open position, which is of course a, something interesting if they know how to play it. But we have the, the better pawn structure and we are going to learn here the tools and the things we need to know to be able to carry on our strategy in that kind of positions so we can actually win the games using our better pawn structure. So the line of d4 is the one that we care about. They play e takes d4, we play queen takes d4, they trade queens here, and then knight takes d4. In some books or publications, we could say that this is some kind of middle game without queens. Well, no matter how we call this uh, situation here, the most important is that we need to understand our plan. We need to understand the things that we need to do and the things that we need to prevent from our opponent. So. The plan is to develop very quickly, usually knight c3, bishop e3 are very normal. Of course we need to castle, usually castling queenside is going to be perfect. But the most important thing we need to understand about this kind of positions is that we need to trade pieces because we are going to try to get into this endgame that I showed you at the beginning of the video. If you can get to this endgame, you are winning. I mean, this endgame is totally won. We are going to see how very soon. But the thing is that if you can get here, you're winning. So the plan, once you're here, is to trade pieces one by one, like minor, a minor piece for a minor piece, rook for rook, and keep going with that idea. And uh, if you trade pieces, you're winning the end game. Very often we can use the open file for that. So you control the open file, you activate your pieces over there, you uh, double rooks on the D file. And once you do that, probably black is going to be forced to, you know, uh, try to fight for that file and then trade pieces on that file. So that's one of the strategies that we are going to use. Also, we are going to trade the minor pieces. Of course, very often they won't want to trade pieces. And here, well, I want to make a pause because uh, I said very often, but actually in many situations, uh, your, opponent, your opponent won't understand what is going on here and they probably don't know whether they need to trade or avoid trades. So that's not so clear, especially uh, intermediate level or beginner level, they won't know what's going on very well and probably they will be okay with trades or at least they won't reject trading that much. But also on inter on advanced level, maybe it's a little more complicated. I guess many players in the range from 1500 to 2000 already know 
uh, this strategy and they know the approach they need to follow in a situation like this. At the same time, I have seen many players who don't know all this strategy on that level. So I think it's, that's what they would think about this line. I mean, uh, you're playing with a deep strategy here that all your opponents don't know. So uh, your opponent is going to be playing a, in a ground that they are not familiar with. And of course, you have already studied the situation and you know what you need to do, what you need to avoid and what you need to get your opponent into. So that's the good thing about this. At the same time, I want to say that uh, this line uh, is, I think it's perfect in, in my personal opinion, it's perfect for players uh, around intermediate level or even advanced level. I think it's going to work very well uh, for those players. For beginner level, I think it might work fine. But for example, we need to win an end game uh, that we are going to see very soon. And uh, I'm not totally sure how well a beginner can play that end game and win. Also on beginner level, there are many blunders and uh, there are other things that make it hard to follow this line of opening mid game and end game exactly or similar to what we are learning here. So I guess for beginners, it's a little more complicated. If you're a beginner, well, you can try it and see how it goes and how you can you know, master this and perfect uh, this idea with the time. But I understand that it's, it's not going to be easy for a beginner to follow all these steps in the opening mid game and end game that we're going to, to study here. But I have the opinion that for intermediate and advanced it's going to be very well. And also wanted to say that for you know professional level uh, tournament players, uh, this is not so great because on, on those levels, the two bishops, I mean, the bishop pair that black is getting <clears throat> in these positions is actually powerful. I mean, it means a lot. If you know how to play with that, uh, probably you can take advantage of it. In general, this position might be like slightly better for black if they know how to handle that. The good thing is that they don't know in a, on intermediate and advanced level, and of course not on beginner level. So that's the plan. We need to trade all these pieces, and if we can do that, well, we are getting into the end game that we want, and that end game is going to be one. So let's assume we can actually trade pieces and we get into this. And now you might be wondering, well, perfect, how is this winning? Uh, okay, seven versus seven, what was it? How do you mean? I mean, what are you saying? How is this winning? It's just a normal pawn end game. And the thing is that it's not a normal pawn end game because here we have a very important advantage. We have a pawn majority over here on the king side that is going to work very well. We can create a passed pawn. Observe that we have a free pawn on E. And from that free pawn, we are going to get a passed pawn at some point. Once we break, supported by the other pawn, of course, we are going to get a passed pawn. However, when we analyze black's pawn majority, they cannot do the same thing because they have a double pawn here. I mean, a double pawns over here and uh, they don't have a free pawn. So they don't have a way to create a passed pawn unless we make something wrong there. They won't be able to do that. Usually, and here we start with some very important ideas for this position that we should not forget. These are vital concepts for this kind of positions. Usually you put your pawns on V shape on the queen side and you never take, I mean, unless they take one pawn, you, you retake, but uh, you never give the first step of, of taking, for example, on B4. <clears throat> and if you do that, he will never be able to create a passed pawn. So this is a trick. Pawns on V shape, either here or a little ahead, maybe at some point. And if you do that, you have a, your opponent will won't have a way to create a passed pawn. At the same time, there is another shape that works very well, and I think it's like this, like, you know, like a, a chain of pawns over there. And again, you never trade, because if you trade, you are going to on double pawns. So you never trade. If he takes, you take back, of course. But you never give the first step. If you do that, he won't have a way to create a passed pawn. So that's how we manage things on the queen side. He won't be able to create the passed pawn, and we will be able to do that on the king side with our e free pawn. Once you get the passed pawn on the king side, uh, the end game is more or less easy. You can think of that end game as a pawn end game with an extra pawn. And any pawn end game, I mean most pawn end games with an extra pawn are winning. So it's just a uh, end game theory. Uh, what you need to know about this. I'm going to give you some ideas, but uh, it's a little about 
end game theory. Like uh, you create your passed pawn. Once you have your passed pawn, your king has freedom to move. Let's say you have a passed pawn on e on e6, and your king on e5, you have freedom to move your king wherever you want, and his king has to be you know around blocking your passed pawn. So once you get that, you have two plans. You can either um, get rid of the pawn. I mean, uh, ignore the pawn, forget the pawn, and go to the king side and capture our pawns. That's a plan to win. Or if you can if you can continue, you know, pushing the pawn and making progress with the pawn, probably you can also get something from that. But the thing is that once you have your passed pawn, uh, it's going to be more or less easy to make progress and be able to win the end game. I think you already have all the theory we need to be able to play this strategy in the real low price exchange variation, the line of d4, and uh, we are ready to see Masters games, real life examples where some master is playing this idea and is able to win using exactly the same process that we have been highlighting here. So let's see the first game. At this point, black is going to play c5. I'm going to move more or less quickly. Uh, the knight goes back and they develop in the first moves. We offer a trade here with bishop f4. I want to make a pause here because uh, we are already using our strategy of uh, trading pieces. And then, well, normal development after that, we both uh, castle queen side and then we use the other strategy that we were saying we use the we, we use the the open file with double rooks over there because one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that our opponent is not going to want to trade but if you get active all the time he's going to have to trade so that's that's the way we force trades we don't need to follow the enemy pieces all over the board we just activate our pieces so much that he is the one who is going to want to trade pieces well um after this, well, here we have the first trade because there is too much pressure. And then we have another trade here. Um, they need to divide the open file, so they need to, to fight for it. There is a trade. And then after this, another trade here on g6. We are going over the right way. And now we have this endgame. It's more or less similar to what we were saying, but there is a minor piece per side. The strategy when that happens, because that's also something that can happen in our games is more or less similar. We have to create a passed pawn and we use it and with the minor piece we can try to make progress. But in any case, you're playing an endgame just like if you had an extra pawn. So just try to make progress. And the uh, worst, worst thing that, that can happen in general is that they can get a draw, I guess, unless we blunder. Uh, we are playing basically we are playing for two results, either a win or a draw. Because uh, there's no way we can lose if he doesn't have a passed pawn here. Also, we want to highlight that we have a B shape over here, as we were saying. Uh, this makes sure that uh, black is not able uh, to make progress on the queen side and they cannot create a passed pawn over there because of the doubled pawns. And this works very well because also uh, black has a light square as bishop. So let's continue with the endgame. We continue maneuvering a little, improving the knight a little more. And at some point, we need to start you know, trying to create our passed pawn. The knight is ready dangerous, very uh, annoying for black in this position, attacking weaknesses. And well, at some point uh, we have another trade here and finally we have our passed pawn on E. Observe that they don't have passed pawn on the queen side. So this is very good. Well, uh, they maneuver a little more and at some point there will be another passed pawn over here. I think if I remember well, uh, the knight covers d5, so the king cannot go over there, and then a check, and then finally, exactly, we have another passed pawn over here. So now, instead of one passed pawn, we have a couple of passed pawns. The rest of the game is basically very simple. For a master, you have two passed pawns, a knight, giving checks, and making progress. Okay, and finally, you can, uh, you know, uh, advance your pawns so much that it's actually totally one for white. Well, after this, the king has to move maybe over here, and then you can play king f6, and of course, this is winning for white. White was able to do all the strategy, all the steps that we were saying. Let's see another example, and this time we have, again, normal development in the opening, and at some point, we're going to castle queen's side. There is this move knight to here to make sure that black is not damaging our pawn structure, so knight to seems like a nice idea, prophylactic, and then we castle queen's side. As we usually do, we get some space on the king's side, we reinforce our center, and then we are going to start with the trades. Uh, one more time, the d5 is going to be key for this purpose. And here we have another move that we need to highlight, bishop c5. 
like if you don't want to trade well you will have to trade look at this move it's like some kind of fork so he's forced to trade pieces after this well a uh, open file again we get really active so at some point they will have to trade pieces even if they don't want well we maneuver a little with our knight we improve the king and then the trade of rooks that we needed after this maneuver with pieces they don't want to trade we continue making progress on the king side and finally we are going to have another trade here let's make sure the king has to go back and then well another end game of knight versus bishop again minor pieces on the board this is something that can happen of course but well the most important thing is that uh, as i said this is not losing uh, is th this is never losing i mean either a win or a draw in general at this point black takes the pawn on a five but actually this is not working very well because after 98 if the king goes over here we have h5 and we will be able to capture the bishop if the king goes over here we have 97 and we have a fork and we're getting the bishop on a five anyway so probably the best thing they can do is king here trade minor piece for minor piece and lose the pawn endgame exactly the strategy that we mentioned for this line at this point, of course, black resigned. Well, the other game I wanted to show you is this one. They advanced the pawn to c5, and then after this, normal development. One more time with castle queenside, and there might be some trades on the open file. Then we maneuver a little, improving our minor pieces, also improving the rook to the open file. We continue with the trades, even more trades. This is perfect, it's exactly what we need. And then this is structure with the pawns in the chain we trade rooks on d8 and then uh, one more time i want to highlight this move that white played here because it's actually very interesting c4 because it's fixing black pawns on dark squares that's exactly what we need and also remember that we have a shape a structure for the pawns it's like this that works very well to prevent black from creating a passed pawn so yeah this is a really nice move this uh, c4 well, after this, we improve our king a little, we continue maneuvering, and we can just play this endgame as if we had an extra pawn. Of course, it's not so easy. We need to maneuver. It's not so easy to actually be able to win. One more time, we need to highlight this. And uh, we need to play some moves. Sometimes it's not clear. Sometimes we need to take our time, try to infiltrate over one side or over the other side. But usually we can make progress at some point. Uh, here there are some trades and what is going to happen after these trades is that white is going to get the past pawn that's what is going to happen so after all the trades we get into this and then we are going to play g4 very soon and we will get a past pawn on the king side and we can play the end game as if we had a, an extra pawn well after this a, the v shape on the queen side one more time they are maneuvering a little this time also black has a problem uh, with the pawns on the queen side because they are fixed on dark squares and that makes them uh, very easy to attack by the white bishop and now there's this move b5 and i think this is just desperation uh, because they know they are in a very tough position this time they trade because they are getting an extra pawn black tries to you know get some compensation but the bishop is able to control the situation over there with the a pawn and also white has like three past pawns so this is just winning for white exactly at this point black resigned a past pawn over here and two past pawns over here white can play c5 anytime they want so in general it shouldn't be hard to win this endgame with white pieces another example is this one and this time normal development in the opening one more time bishop on e3 knight on c3 we castle queenside as we were saying and then we start maneuvering improving step by step and also forcing trades one more time this move bishop c5 the second time that we see it in this uh, list of games forcing trades of pieces and probably that would be more trades in the next moves because we are improving our pieces all the time. Also, something I haven't said about that move, a uh, bishop c5. It's not only trading pieces, it's also getting rid of black's bishop pair. Remember that the main compensation for black in these positions is the bishop pair. So if they are able to activate the bishops, uh, break, open some line, create some weakness, then the bishops are going to be a problem for us. 
So bishop c5 is not only trading pieces, it's also getting rid of the main compensation that black has in these positions. Well, then, uh, as I was saying, some trades in the center, we maneuver with the knight, and then the d file is going to help us to trade pieces. Once we get this, we have an endgame with minor piece. Again, we have a pawn already on the king side. And, well, it's just a matter of technique. Of course, we need to play well and we need to maneuver. It's not going to be easy. But if we play the right moves, we can win this endgame. And again, remember, we are playing for two results. Either a win or a draw. Because we have an extra pawn. They don't have past pawns here. Well, after this, there is a mistake there with king f8 and this is going to force a trade. And of course, this is very easily won. And well, at the end, there is this move uh, a4. It's totally unnecessary, but it also works. We can just play a3 here, b-shape, b-shape as we were saying, and they don't have a way to create a past one as long as we don't as long as we don't capture on b4. But well, a4 works the same way. They will never be able to create a past one after this a4. And the thing is that, of course, we are taking the pawn on the king side, and also we are winning very easily that endgame. Finally, another example, and it's going to be like this. Uh, we have normal development as always, and then we are going to castle queenside, and then we start offering trades. Bishop d6 is the first trade here that we can force, and one more time we get rid of the bishop pair, and again the open file to trade pieces, and then we maneuver and improve a little. We don't need to trade here on b4, observe that if we capture, we are going to undouble the pawn structure. Instead of doing that, we can use this pawn, it's a weakness, we can attack it, and it's going to be very annoying for, for black, for sure. So that's a much better strategy, knight a4. At this point, there will be some tactics in this game. There is this sacrifice here on d7 to do a fork. This is not getting a piece as it seems, because our knight is going to be trapped in the corner. The good thing is that we're getting into the endgame that we were saying. I mean, it's basically a pawn endgame where our pawn majority on the king side works and his pawn majority on the queen side is useless. So let's see how this finishes. Some tactics there. The knight is trapped and they can get the knight, but it doesn't really matter because the pawn endgame is totally won. We're going to create a passed pawn and we're going to play it as if we had an extra pawn. C4 is an important move here to fix the queen side, make sure there is no uh, counterattack over there. And then one more time we need to maneuver a little. Observe that it's not so clear how we can make progress because there are many pawns there uh, blocking the little, uh, controlling all the squares. It's not easy to make progress. But finally, after some moves, white is able to create some unbalance here. And the idea is that look at this move e5. They are going to get the passed pawn over here, over the g file. So black will have to come over here and then we capture on e and then we are going to be closer from the pawns on the queen side so it's a very typical uh, way to win pawn end games we create a farther past pawn and using that farther past pawn we can win because his king has to go to the other side and we are closer from the rest of the pawns well after this you know e5 and we capture on g5 and just maneuver a little more but this is totally won after this we get the pawn on e5 and, well, it's just a matter of making progress very easily, capturing pawns and promoting your C pawn. So summing up, if you play Rue Lopez exchange variation, there is this strategy that you can follow and it can work very well because you're going to get into an angle that is totally won. So you can start here and then play Rue Lopez exchange variation. After some trades, you will get something like this. And if you can force the trade of the pieces, you can get into something like this if you get there i mean they take uh the, the knight so if you get there then you're totally winning the end game because you have a very useful pawn majority on the king side and you can win the end game using that pawn majority you can play the end game just like if you had an extra pawn because that's what you have over here on the king side on the file also we need to highlight a very important concept that if you get something like this in the end game use your pawns uh, use this V shape to make sure that he's not creating a passed pawn on the queen side and you never capture over there, just recapture if he takes, of course, 
but you never give the first step and you're going to be good. Also, you can use this chain of pawns like this, and it's also working very well. Again, you don't need to give the first step with the trades and he will never be able to create a past one as you can make a lot of progress on the king side. So thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like or subscribe if you found something useful here. YouTube says that this video over here is going to be good for you. So, you know, check it out. Thank you guys. Play the right move. See you in the next. It's also getting rid of the main compensation of the main read.